to destroy the works. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. This program is brought to you by the Churches of Christ. We now invite you to open your Bibles and your minds as we present the Gospel of Christ. And now, Ben Bailey. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Welcome to our study of James chapter 3, in which James addresses the Christian and the tongue. James will discuss the unruly, untamable nature of the tongue apart from God and His wisdom and how we must trust Him to learn how to control our tongue. Throughout history, the tongue has done much damage. In the words that have been spoken, unkind, unfriendly, hateful, words of violence, words of prejudice, words have done a lot of harm throughout history, but words. The tongue has also been used for good in preaching the gospel, in encouraging others, in lifting those up who are struggling. And so the tongue has the potential to give life or death, depending on how we choose to use it. And God encourages us to use the tongue wisely. James begins with a warning. In James chapter 3 and verse 1, James says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. James places before us the warning and the caution. Not everybody needs to become a teacher because they're going to give stricter judgment and he'll lead right in then to a discussion of the tongue. How are those two ideas together? Unless a person has learned and has gained wisdom in controlling the tongue, that person doesn't need to be put in a place of teaching. Is this passage trying to discourage people from teaching? No, that's not the intent. Rather, James is showing us the serious nature of the tongue. For example, like the words of Jesus in Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37, the Bible teaches that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And so not everybody needs to be a teacher, only those who are striving to follow God's advice and let their tongue be controlled by the, Lord, by the word of the Lord. Now, here's why that's important, especially in a teaching role. For someone who's teaching the gospel, the authority of God must be at the top, Matthew 28, 18. Someone who's trying to lead men and women to Jesus, Luke 19, 10. They need to have their tongue in check so that what they say when they preach the truth, it's from love, Ephesians 4, verse 15. And, and making sure that they do study and know and preach that which is true to the will of God. And so the tongue must be controlled, especially among those who are going to teach the gospel and preach the word of God to other folks. Now, as we think about James chapter 3, James is going to show us that, that since we all do sin, the sign of a mature Christian is one who can control his tongue. For example, notice James chapter 3, verse number 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. It's true that we do from time to time fall and stumble and make mistakes. And James says, here's a mark of someone who has spiritual maturity. He can control his tongue. Now, take your attention back for just a moment to James chapter 1, verse 26. And in discussing being doers of the word, James has already hinted at this idea. James 1.26 says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his own tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. James says, you think you're religious, bridle your tongue. 
If you don't do that, everything else is in vain. And so we've got to control the tongue. Yes, it's true we sin. We fall short. But friend, let's let God have that divine control over our tongue so that we can learn to let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. James chapter 1, verse number 19. Now, James is now going to show us that the tongue, although one of the smallest members of the body, it's very, very powerful in its effect. For example, James will say that the tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth. Notice James chapter 3, beginning in verse number 3. The Bible says, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that, we, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. What's, what's the illustration of the, the power of the tongue and its likeness to a small member that has great power? The tongue would be like a bit in a horse's mouth. Here's how. That bit, it's very small. But what's interesting is when you place that bit on top of the horse's mouth and you pull on top of the horse's tongue and you pull down, you can control the whole body just by putting a little pressure on the tongue. Now you think about the practical applications there. We learn to put a little pressure on our tongue. We learn to slow the tongue down. Be careful what we say. The whole course of a person's life has the ability to change. Uh, the tongue is like a bit in a horse's mouth in that it makes that wild, unruly animal something that's obedient. Put a little pressure on the tongue draw back on the reins, what happens? Over time, that wild, unruly animal begins to be brought under control, begins to be brought into obedience, begins to have the personality and the quality traits that any good horse would have. Well, friend, you relate that to a Christian. We become controlled by, and we learn to obey the will of God, and the more we learn, the more we study, the more we put these things into practice, the more we control our tongue the more we are in line in obedience to the will of God. Now, here's another way in which the tongue and the bit are alike. You put that bit in the horse's mouth, and you place a little pressure on the tongue, and you can control the whole horse. Now, friend, that's the idea here. If we can control the tongue, we can control the man. Why? Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 23. I, I speak what I think. If I can begin to control my thinking before it comes out of my mouth, I've already got a handle on my mind. I'm bringing every thought into captivity to Christ, and I'm in the place where now I can control the whole body. Getting control of the tongue is an indicator that you have control of the body, and thus we must, we must make sure when we get control of the tongue, one's body and one's spiritual life is being brought under control as well. Now, James likens the tongue to another small member that has great power from a worldly illustration. For example, James chapter 3, verse number 4 says this, Look also at ships, although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Here James likens the tongue to a small rudder on a large ship. At the back end of a ship you have a rudder. That rudder compared to the size of the ship is very small. You can turn that rudder any direction and as you turn the rudder it turns the whole direction of the ship with just that small rudder changing the direction. Well here's the idea. It's controlled through fierce winds. It has the ability to hold steady. That small rudder on the back of that ship has the power to move thousands of pounds of weight with ease when controlled properly. The rudder controls the whole direction of the ship if it's operated properly. If the captain, the pilot, uses that rudder correctly in the ship, it makes that job of the pilot, the captain, so much easier in every way. Here's the point. Our tongue can control the whole direction of life and the man itself if the individual controls it properly. If we use our tongue properly, we have the power to take what God's given us and use it for His glory. For example, 
a, a person who has control of his tongue and is trying to use that small member to the glory of God, he can use that in a multiplicity of ways that will honor the Father. He can praise God. As James 1 verse 17 says, every good and perfect gift c comes from above. He can use his tongue in prayer to ask for wisdom. James chapter 1 verse 5, he can use his tongue to encourage others. Hebrews 3 verse 12 and 13. And the greatest of all, he can use that tongue to teach. James 3 verse 1, Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. And so getting control of the tongue has the ability to change the whole direction if it's operated properly by the one controlling it. Now, James then uses a last illustration of the tongue to show that it's small and it's powerful and it must be contained. James chapter 3, verse number 5 says this, Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Now watch this. See how great a forest a little fire kindles and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and is, it sets on fire the course of nature and set on fire by hell. What's James trying to say here? James is pointing to us that if you don't control that spark of the tongue, it can have a lot of damage. The tongue can be like a small spark. This starts a whole forest fire. You hear stories of this. Someone may throw something out, maybe a cigarette, maybe a match out the window, think nothing of it. Next thing you know, that small spark has got the whole forest on fire. Here's James's point. The tongue's like a small spark that starts a big fire in this sense. It's small, but it can be very destructive. Do you remember Proverbs 18, 21? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's the power the tongue has. It has great power. James is trying to get us to see that the tongue, it can bring a world of unrighteousness. The things we say are the things we think. And the things I say, if those are ungodly, if those are improper, if those are things that are indecent and immoral, that brings a whole world of unrighteousness, unrighteousness into my life. It can inflame the course of one's life. People who can't control their tongue. You can think about examples of these yourself. Politicians, uh, figures in maybe TV world who are very popular, how often do they have to say they were sorry? They didn't really mean to say that. They said something and they didn't really think it through. Well, control of the tongue. If you don't control it, it can inflame the whole course of life and eventually it can lead to destruction in hell. A person is going to be judged based on the idle words he says. Mark Matthew 12, verse 36. We're going to give an account of every word that we speak if it's not according to the will of God. And if that's not made right by the blood of Jesus and repentance, then friend, one can be lost for the words that he says as well. In James chapter 3, James teaches us that unlike every wild beast, no man can tame the tongue. He says that in James chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. Now, I want you to notice exactly what the point of this is. James is directing our attention to the fact that man has tamed every wild beast. You think of a wild beast somewhere, whatever it may be, from alligators, to lions, to tigers, to whatever it may be, elephant, whatever it may be, man has had the ability to tame those and does tame those. But then James says, no man can tame the tongue. What's James's point? Is he trying to now that he's encouraged us to control the tongue, teach us that it's not untamable, that it's a futile effort? No, that's not his point. No man can tame the tongue is the point. What's James trying to get at? Human beings can't do it by ourselves. In and of myself, I don't have the power to control the tongue, but with God's help and God's wisdom, oh yes, the tongue can and must be tamed by God and by His Word. Well, how do we do that? We've got to learn to use our tongue for the right purpose, not wrong purposes. Look in James chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who've been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. How do you let God control the tongue? By realizing what's the right purpose and the wrong purpose. Now, think about this. If you curse somebody with your tongue and that person's made in the image of God, 
Does that really make sense? In essence, who are you cursing? Well, you're cursing something that God made. With it, we bless God and curse men. Those are contradictory ideas. And so James's idea is to get control of the tongue. Don't use your tongue to run other people down, to say bad things about other people, and to hurt them in this life. You could sing praises to God in one minute and say something bad about... That's contradictory. You can't really praise God and curse man at the same time. Rather, we need to put our trust in the Almighty. Now, for just a moment, I want you to think with me about some verses. As we said at the outset of this study, James and the book of Proverbs go hand in hand in many of their ideas. And one of those ideas, Proverbs has a lot to say about the tongue. And I want us to see some of God's wisdom related to that for just a moment. What did Solomon, who was given wisdom from on high, say about the tongue? Notice Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 17. The Bible says, A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood are among some of the things God hates. What do I need to know to really control the tongue? God hates a tongue that lies. Liars will have their part in the lake of fire, Revelation 21.8. Instead of lying to control my tongue, I've got to speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4 verse 15. I've got to say what's true and what's right, regardless of what consequences there may be for me or to me for doing that. Now, another passage in the book of Proverbs is Proverbs chapter number 8, verse number 7. Solomon says, For my mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. What do I know about controlling the tongue? Not only do I not lie, it's not enough just not to lie. You've also got to do what's right and speak the truth. If something's wrong, we need to say it's wrong. We need to stand up for what's right. We need to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. I can't remain silent and say, now I've got control of the tongue. No, you don't have control of the tongue until you not only stop saying what's wrong, but start saying what's right. Say what God has said. Uh, Romans 4, verse 3, we need to ask, is there any word from the Lord, or what does the Scripture say? And then we need the courage with our tongue to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Another passage from the book of Proverbs is found in Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 19. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. What's the point here? The person who's just kind of running off at the mouth, the person who's just always putting something out, that person, his chances of saying something wrong go up with every word he says. Rather, instead of the multitude of words, we need to restrain our words. You know, it's not about how much we say. It's about what we say. It's not about the quantity, but the content of our words that matters. And so I need to learn, I don't have to be the one always speaking. All of us can know people like this. You've known people and I've known people that anytime there's a conversation, they've got to dominate that conversation. They've got to say the first word, the middle word, and the last word. Well, the Christian doesn't have to have a multiplicity of words to be wise. Rather, when he thinks about it, says what's necessary. That's what's important for the child of God. Now, watch some more from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 12, verse number 18 teaches us the power of the tongue. For example, the scripture says, there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword. Now watch this though. But the tongue of the wise promotes health. Oh yes, there's the person, and we've all run into them, whose tongue is like a sword, and every time you get near them, they just kind of prick you with it. You don't want to be around people like that. But then there's the person whose tongue promotes health. What's that mean? They're trying to do good. They're trying to let every word be seasoned with salt. Colossians chapter 4. They're trying to encourage, uplift, and speak the things God wants them to speak. As a Christian, I want to say things that will lift up. I want to say things that will correct, maybe even rebuke. I may have to at times, but I want to say that from the motive of love. I want to say it with the right heart, the right attitude, so that rather than breaking down, my words encourage, 
uplift and strive to help others look to Jesus for the love and the mercy that he has. All right, Proverbs chapter 15 verse 4 says this, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A tree of life. What's that mean? It's, it's giving life. It's something that the words you can live off of almost. Well, in the greatest sense, control of the Christian's tongue and mind no doubt means we're looking for people that we can point toward Jesus. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel unto every creature. There's control of the tongue. Do you have the control of the tongue to actually say what you need to say? Do I have control of my tongue enough that when I know somebody is not a child of God, needs the gospel, that I've got enough control to say it? Am I willing to seek and save the lost like Jesus did? Luke 19.10 Will I speak as the oracles of God? 1 Peter 4.11 Am I ready to give an answer? 1 Peter 3 verse 15 Do I really see as Paul said in Colossians 1.28 Give we preach, Jesus we preach, warning every man, teaching every man that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Are our words like a tree of life? Are they really encouraging others to be faithful to God? Then we learn from Proverbs chapter 16 verse 1 that the, really the only way to speak the right answer is to let God's word do the speaking. Notice Proverbs 16 verse 1. The plans of the heart belong to man but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. What's all that about? Well, I may make plans, but who gets the final say? God does. And with my tongue. When I'm going to answer somebody, when someone wants to ask a Bible question, somebody wants to ask me for advice, how can I give an answer that is right with my tongue? Right here. We need to approach the Bible and say, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, 17. We need to let the Bible speak, look to the word of God, and give a Bible answer. That's the way we can give the right answer with the tongue. Now, I've often heard it said, and you've heard it said, and it's definitely not true. Not true. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. Friend, that's just false to the core. In fact, the Bible says our words have more power than sticks and stones. Listen to Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Sticks and stones may break your bones. Words have power over your life. That's what the Bible says. Words have the power to encourage, to, to strengthen, to build up, to point people towards eternal life, or if my words are unkind, if I say things I ought not to, if I speak in ways that a Christian ought not to, those words can affect somebody spiritually, can bring death to their life. And so death and life, they're in the power of the tongue. The tongue indeed is a powerful member of the Christian's body. Now, one last passage that I want you to notice, and this is a very important one. The Bible says this in Proverbs 21, verse number 23. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from trouble. What do I need to learn about controlling the tongue? I need a guard over my tongue. I need to make sure that I check and I double check everything that comes out of my mouth. What's that mean? I've got to slow down and let every man be swift to hear. I've got to think about it. Listen to it. Slow to speak. Slow down and process it. Then speak. I've got to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Put a guard over your tongue. Don't let anything out that's not right and good and holy in the sight of God. Now, the latter part of James chapter 3 will encourage us along the lines of wisdom. In James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, we need to seek and take advantage of godly wisdom. Notice these verses with me. The scripture says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But 
The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. As a child of God, I need to make sure that I'm seeking godly wisdom. Godly wisdom can come in several different ways. I gain wisdom from God's wisdom in the Bible. As I study, as I read the Bible, as I become acquainted with the scriptures teach, I gain wisdom. I learn from the book of James. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, it will be given to him. James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. I learn wisdom through sometimes trial and error. As I see things that didn't work and as I examine that or maybe something happens in my life and I step back and look at it, I can step back, look and learn. And so what's the key to controlling the tongue? Guard it. Watch it carefully. Don't say anything you haven't thought about and seek God's wisdom in control of the tongue. Now as we mentioned, the greatest use that a person could ever have for their tongue is preaching the gospel, telling men and women about the love of God. Friend, that's what we want to do today. We want you to know just how much the God of heaven loves you deeply. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves you and He loves me deeply so much. He sent Jesus to come to this earth to live a perfect life, uh, to give us the Word of God, to die on the cross, to make that once for all sacrifice and to prepare the way to heaven itself. Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel today, we encourage you to do that. Have you heard the Word? Romans 10 verse 17. Do you really believe Jesus is God's Son? Acts chapter 2 verses 36 through 38. Are you willing to change your life and repent, Acts 3, verse 19. Would you make that good confession just like the Ethiopian eunuch? Acts 8, verse 37 through 39. And friend, to put the whole body, not just the tongue, in use to service to God, would you be immersed in water for the remission of your sins? Jesus said in John 3 and verse 5, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. May God help us seek to strive daily to live for Him and honor Him with every part of our life. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. To God be the glory. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee 37111